This represents the general reaction that corresponds to an elimination. Y and Z don't have to be single atoms. They can be groups of atoms. But we're going to see that there are a few common examples of what Y corresponds to and what Z corresponds to. Oftentimes, one of those uh, is a hydrogen atom, and the other is, well, something else. And um, you can see that reaction still leaves each of those carbons with four bonds, but now it's a double and two singles. Uh, and so we have made an alkene from something that did not have that double bond um, initially. And these are the three most important types of elimination reactions. They all begin with the letters DE because in chemistry that means you are removing something. Dehydrogenation is the first one, so you can see we're taking hydrogens from adjacent carbons, and that's a general method for turning alkanes into alkenes. Dehydration, just like you already know that word to mean, it means a lack of water, and so if you remove water uh, from an alcohol, OH from one carbon, hydrogen from an adjacent one, you can see water is a byproduct, but you also get uh, an alkene. That's a very common way for introducing a carbon-carbon double bond because alcohols are plentiful and pretty much all of them can be dehydrated. Um, this last one is the same kind of thing except this X would be one of the halogens and especially when it is chlorine or bromine that's a very common thing to remove uh, that halogen along with a hydrogen from next door. So dehydrohalogenation is the fancy term for doing that. In the laboratory, dehydration is probably the most common of those three types of things. And we will be dehydrating an alcohol in one of our labs. And you can see all of these are essentially involving the same process. We take away the OH group, but we're also removing a hydrogen from adjacent to that, that carbon. And so that gives us uh, our double bond and in every case water as a byproduct. Uh, these conditions tell us that we need a catalyst to make this happen and sulfuric acid is a very common one. Um, in chapter 4 we were talking about using things like HCl or HBr to react with alcohols and in that case the outcome was oftentimes substitution. But sulfate is not a very good nucleophile so that's why we tend to get a lot of the alkene. Uh, but with any acid, you're bound to get a little bit of substitution and at least a little bit of dehydration. And so those um, processes compete with one another. And when we get less than 100% yield when we're trying to do a substitution, it's often because we have done uh, an elimination whether we wanted to or not. Um, the fact that this third one only involves mild heat instead of these greater temperatures means that this tertiary alcohol dehydrates more readily. So just as tertiary alcohols were more quick to undergo substitution reactions, uh, we find that they are also quick to undergo dehydration reactions. Turns out it's for the same reason. Uh, if we're not using sulfuric acid, then uh, this is phosphoric acid down on the bottom, H3PO4. That's a common catalyst. Phosphate is also a bad nucleophile, so we normally get eliminations as opposed to substitution. And this uh, is a potassium hydrogen sulfate salt that m works much the same way that the um, sulfuric acid does. It's just an alternative for, again, encouraging these reactions. What all of these have in common is that there's only one possible alkene. Um, in the middle one here, the cyclohexanol, I could just as easily imagine the double bond forming up here towards the top of the ring. I just chose to draw that double bond uh, along the side. Um, but either way, you make cyclohexene if you dehydrate cyclohexanol. But oftentimes when we have an alcohol, depending on which hydrogen gets removed along with the OH, uh, we can have a mixture of possible alkenes. And that's what's coming up next.